Story of a great king, a worshipper, a slave of Allah Azzawajal, who was probably not a prophet of God. However, definitely he was a Muslim, a Unitarian, you know, believed in only one God, Alhamdulillah. And despite his wealth and power and strength, Allah Azzawajal, that Allah gave him, he was a king who worshipped Allah Azzawajal sincerely. And Allah Azzawajal had given him phenomenal strength, phenomenal both physical strength to be able to lift things and carry things and, and move things. But also his army that Allah Azzawajal had given him was a formidable army. And one of the things that Dhul Qarnayn loved to do or had a vision of was he wanted to bring a lot of the world under the rule of Allah Azzawajal. Yes, under his rule and authority, but the point was that he would spread Tawheed at the same time, Alhamdulillah, as well. They ask you about Dhul Qarnayn. Verily we, meaning Allah Azzawajal, we established him in the earth and we gave him from every single matter a way and a path. Meaning we eased his affair in every matter. First of all, had no financial worries, he was a king. Secondly, he had no power issues because mashallah Allah gave him a huge army that was formidable. Also, uh, you know, many kings suffer from bad image. But no, he had a good image and people uh, knew about Dhul Qarnayn and they knew that he was a righteous king and that he was a pious man and he worshipped only one God and he was God-fearing, alhamdulillah. So he had a good name, alhamdulillah. Therefore, his subjects did not fear him. They revered him and they praised him and many of them loved him as well. His enemies feared him and so even before he attacked them, enemies were almost destroyed by the fear that they had in their heart. So he took a path meaning he wanted to go somewhere, so he took a, a path to, of travel until he had come to a place where the sun sets, meaning he went west. And when he went west, he found the sun going down in murky waters. What is this murky waters? Some scholars said it's a black sea. Others said, no, it's the Aegean Sea. And upon that area, he found a people. It was revealed to him, O Dal Qarnayn, do you want to punish them or do you want to, do you want to leave them in goodness? So. What does Dhul Qarnayn choose to do? As for the one who has wronged himself, then we'll punish that person. Then he'll be taken back to his Lord, meaning after he dies, then Allah will punish him a punishment that is t tremendous or unheard of. As for the one who believes and does righteous deeds, then I will give him good rewards. And I will say to him from my affair that which will be easy for him. Then he decided to move on and he took another path until he reached where the sun comes up. Some said it's Africa, some said it's Asia. Wallahu ta'ala alam. This would have been in the east somewhere. And he found that the sun was coming up over a people. We have not put from them, meaning from the sun, any covering for them against the sun. So they were basically savages who did not even have proper dwellings, who did not even cover themselves properly who had basically almost no barrier against, uh, against the sun and they lived in the east. In the same way, we had encompassed whatever we had given him, blessed him from skills. Therefore, he took another path in order to travel. Where did he go? Turkey, around that area. Until he reached the area, which is Turkmenistan, he reached two mountains. And according to some of the narrations from the pious predecessors, shows that these two Saddain are actually in southern Turkey. And he found that just beyond the mountains were a people he simply almost never understood what they were saying. Meaning, they had a very different language, they had a unique way of speaking, and he simply almost did not understand. But Alhamdulillah, Allah gave him uh, knowledge, and he had translators, and soon he understood. So what did the people say? They said, oh, the possessor of two horns, verily, Juj and Majuj, who were Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Some scholars mention, or uh, Ibn Abbas who mentions that they were originally Turkish Mongol in origin. Other scholars mention that their origins are from that, uh, the Mongolian, the Turkish, uh, the Chinese mixed with Asian uh, features. And uh, however, the, 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 the tafsir from Ibn Abbas which is authentic, mentions that their forefather was from the Turks. They were either the Tatars, Mongols, 
or people like them uh, that lived in Central Asia, in, in that region, and unfortunately they created a lot of mischief. They said, oh, the Al-Qarnayn. Verily, yeah, Juj and Ma'juj, these two tribes, they've created a lot of mischief on the earth. So can we pay you a fee? Can we give you some money so that you can put a barrier between us and them? So what did, uh, what did he say? He said, look, what God has already given me is enough. Yeah, I don't need your wealth, but I'm here to help. I'm going to help you. And I can see that these people are spreading mischief. And my values are you don't spread mischief. So you want me to help you? Come support me in this cause that you want me to finish. So help me with your strength, meaning with your wealth and with your money and with your people, time, effort, all types of strength. Give me all of that so that I can put between you and them a dam, a dam or a barrier that will stop these people from coming and destroying your town. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj were unique people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them the human beings. But they are people who have significant mischief. People like to vandalize and pillage and destroy. They will live in a city, but then they will burn it down afterwards. They will see a, see a tree and instead of picking its fruit, they will cut the branches of the tree until the whole tree will fall. Then they'll grab the, the fruit of the tree. Very mischievous human beings. Give me blocks of iron. And they were able to bring large pieces of iron to help Dhul Qarnayn. So what did Dhul Qarnayn do? He created big cauldrons, started to melt the iron until he had then closed off the gap between the two mountains. He said, now breathe into it, meaning blow into these, these furnaces so that the iron can melt until this iron had now become molten lava, it had become fire. Now give me copper so that I can mix copper into the iron. Now the copper molten brass with iron forms a compound that is very strong much more stronger than steel. This is the barrier that Dhul Qarnayn created in order to stop the Ya'juj and from coming. So therefore they could not pass this dam. He said, this is a mercy from Allah Azawajal. In the authentic hadith, it is narrated that every single day Ya'juj and Ma'juj is trying to get out every single day. And they try and plow and they dig and they dig and they dig trying to get through and the, it's very, very, very deep. So they can't get through, they can't get out, they can't, they're actually alive now. They can't get out and every single time they dig and then they come back, so we'll, say, we'll, we'll carry on next day. When they try to come back next day, they find the wall is getting wider and wider and meaning thicker and thicker. Until one day will come when they will say, Inshallah, we'll come back and they will say, Inshallah. And then that day they will come back and they'll find that the wall has not increased and they'll keep on digging and they'll, then they'll get out on that day. And Allah knows which day that will happen. So Dhul Qarnayn is teaching us that even a great king, when he achieves something very big, that they attribute it back to Allah Azawajal. And remember that this is not going to stay all the time. But if the promise of Allah Azawajal comes, Allah will then destroy this barrier. And the promise of my Lord is always true. Dhul Qarnayn, Dhu meaning the possessor of Qarnayn, the two horns, it was either one of a few people that this historian said. Some said he was either Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great couldn't have been Dhul Qarnayn because Alexander the Great worshipped idols and uh, he obviously he had atrocities in his kingdom. The only reason why they mentioned uh, Alexander the Great because they're looking in history who is there that had actually gone east and west and you know everywhere and conquered quite a lot. There is another one who wasn't so well known, but that is also mentioned in the Jewish scriptures as the one who conquered Babylon and freed the Israelites. So the Israelis, uh, the Banu Israel, they praised this man uh, whose name was Cyrus, King Cyrus. They praised him because he freed the Israelites. He used to worship only one God, only believe in only one God, and was a you know a righteous man. So if you look at the story of this king called Cyrus, he was anointed as a king, I think around about 549, conquered Babylon 550, something around there. Uh, and then he went around conquering some of the other places he went. So the world was open to him. He could go to Africa, he can go to Asia, he can go to Europe. So all of this was open to him. And this is precisely what is mentioned over here in the Quran that he went east-west and alhamdulillah he conquered quite a lot, alhamdulillah.